Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Friday, everybody. I hope you've had a productive week, and I wish you a restful weekend ahead. Today's episode is being filmed、uh, somewhere different. There's a bit of an echo in this room. My apologies. In advance for the audio. Before we move into the main stories, I wanted to quickly discuss a small matter. Since the last video went up yesterday, the channel has hit seventy thousand subscribers. Every time I hit one of these little milestones, I'm reminded of just how fortunate I am to be able to do work that I love and share it with so many people. I started this channel because I felt like there was a need to have a better understanding of China through grounded analysis, and I wanted to share that exploration with people. At the time, I thought that it would be amazing if I could find 100 like-minded people to follow along with me. I never dreamed that the subscriber numbers would reach the tens of thousands. I'm deeply honoured to be able to produce these videos for you all every day, and I deeply appreciate the incredible support you have provided, in some cases for years. Thank you so much. And I promise that my commitment to grounded and sober analysis of China remains as iron firm as ever. Thank you. Now let's move into the video. We have two developments to cover, and then in part three we will discuss the bombshell story about the role of Chinese money in a massive global drug money laundering network. For those who want to skip right to it, they can do so with the chapter feature below. Yesterday, a meeting of the Supreme Decision-Making Body, the Politburo, announced that the third plenary session, also known as the third plenum of the 20th Central Committee of the Party, will be held in Beijing from the 15th through to the 18th of July. We will be following this event closely when it happens. What was also noteworthy from the meeting yesterday is that it reviewed and approved the Central Military Commission's investigation reports into Wei Fanghe and Li Shengfu, and quote approved their expulsion from the party. End quote. Their cases have now been handed over to prosecutors. This is significant. Both these military leaders were former ministers of defence, with Wei serving as commander of the PLA Rocket Force as well. Now both have been very publicly purged. Andrew Yang, an expert on the Chinese military who formerly served in Taiwan's Ministry of Defense, speaking to U.S.-based The New York Times, expressed, "Quote: The announcements seem to point to something very serious." I think we can expect comprehensive investigations into the military, not only in the rocket force but also in other sectors. End quote. The official readout said that their actions quote, is extremely serious, the impact is extremely adverse, and the harm is particularly great. End quote. Of course, so much of the system is so opaque that we don't really know what happened. Quote, There had been rumors for months that Wei Fenghe was in trouble, but this is the first official confirmation. Based on the respective readouts, it sounds like Li Shengfu may have paid bribes for promotion, as well as accepting bribes, whereas Wei just took bribes. It would be remarkable if, after all the PLA anti-corruption work, buying and selling of PLA promotions is still happening. No wonder there is a rectification and political training campaign underway in the People's Liberation Army. And she took the top leadership of the military to Yan'an for the CMC Political Work Conference. She must be feeling personally betrayed by this high-level corruption. End quote. Indeed, Singapore-based The Straits Times writes that the corruption allegations against Wei and Li quote are an embarrassment for Mr. Xi, who had removed several top military officers at the start of his first term in the name of fighting corruption. But the very generals Mr. Xi had appointed to replace generals toppled for graft are now themselves said to be guilty of accepting bribes. End quote. An unnamed China-based military diplomat told the Straits Times, quote, "The buck should stop with him since he promoted all of them, but he will probably emerge looking good for being tough on corruption." End quote. There was no mention of Qin Gang, the former foreign minister who disappeared a year ago. Next up, at the beginning of the week, we discussed a knife attack on a Japanese school bus, resulting in three people being stabbed. There was little information on the incident at the time, and there still is limited information. But there are some salient points we should touch on now to supplement the story. Now, knife attacks are relatively common across China. The reason we are covering this one is because it came right after an attack on four U.S. college representatives in the northeast of the country. Causing some to ask whether increasing anti-foreign sentiment is leading to these attacks. 
Just to recap, on Monday, a knife attack in the wealthy eastern city of Suzhou, not far from Shanghai, injured three people. Two of the victims were a Japanese mother and her child. The third was a Chinese woman who tried to block the attacker. The incident took place at a bus stop where the two Japanese victims were waiting for a school bus that would take them to a local Japanese school. After injuring the first two, the attacker tried to get onto the bus and was blocked by the Chinese victim who was on the bus. It thus appears that this older Chinese woman is a hero who may have prevented several children or more being injured or even murdered. The incident took place in a district that is home to many foreign nationals, including Japanese nationals. In Tokyo on Tuesday, Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshimasa Hayashi said, It is regrettable that such an incident had occurred, expressing, quote, We've asked local authorities to take measures to prevent a recurrence and share detailed information. End quote. The same day, the police in Suzhou took, uh, said in a statement rather, that the suspect was a 52-year-old unemployed man who was apprehended at the scene by police officers and has now been criminally detained. Soon after, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning expressed regret over the occurrence of such an incident, saying that, quote, China will continue to take effective measures to protect the safety of foreign nationals in China, just like the way it protects Chinese residents, end quote. However, just like after the attack on the Americans a few weeks ago, the PRC foreign ministry said that this was an isolated incident, not related to any anti-foreign feelings, but rather economic causes. State media has also pushed this position, with some even going on the offensive. Say Run the Global Times on Wednesday, for example, wrote that, quote, the direct involvement of a high-profile Japanese official like Hayashi in the incident before an investigation has been concluded is unusual and suggests that the Japanese government is intentionally making a spectacle out of the incident. End quote. However, Japanese media has met this official PRC position with skepticism. Japan based The Japanese Times, for example, reported yesterday, quote, although his motive has not been disclosed, this may have been a premeditated attack targeting Japanese nationals. The Japanese school in Suzhou has suffered harassment, such as eggs being thrown into the premises. Following the treated water discharge, which started in August 2023. End quote. Regular viewers will remember that there was a fiery state media blitz against Japan following the Fukushima water discharge last year. When Halma, a reporter at US based Voice of America, published a piece this week called How Conspiracy Theories Might Have Led to Assault on Japanese Mother and Son in China. Let's end this part with some of his observations. Quote, While it is not a secret that anti-Japanese sentiment runs rampant on Chinese social media and among certain sectors of the Chinese public due to historical conflicts, including wars, territorial, territorial disputes, and Beijing's cultivation of online nationalism through propaganda and disinformation, on Chinese internet there are also conspiracy theories specifically targeting Japanese schools in China such as the one in Suzhou that the child victim went to. Purveyors of these conspiracy theories suggest or outright claim that these schools train spies and are a conduit through which the Japanese government invades China culturally. On Chinese social media, Japanese schools have become somewhat of a subject that attracts curiosity, suspicion and views. Vloggers would visit the perimeters of these schools and record and talk about what they see. The Japanese school in Suzhou, where one of the knife attack victims attended, was one of the schools often featured in these videos. End quote. Next up, and finally for today, the UK-based Financial Times has published an excellent and frankly quite shocking article on capital flight from China and its role in a huge and growing global drug money laundering network. The report is called The New Money Laundering Network Fueling the Fentanyl Crisis. U.S. officials say Chinese organized crime groups are laundering much of the cash accumulated by Mexican drug cartels. An unnamed senior Chinese official was even quoted as saying, quote, The level of capital flight in the past three years have been quite alarming. Some wealthy private entrepreneurs are losing confidence in China's future. They feel unsafe, so they are finding ways to get their money out. End quote. To end today's video, we will examine some of this report. And by the way, if you're getting some value from today's video, don't forget to hit the like button 
and subscribe. Now let's examine some of the report from the Financial Times, which we are now quoting selected excerpts from directly. The DEA initially thought the cash deliveries were the routine result of the soaring sales of fentanyl in the US, but during the course of their investigation, they suspected the drop-offs were also part of a sophisticated and growing form of illicit finance that involves so-called Chinese underground banks and the Mexican drug cartels. Last week, prosecutors accused a group that included nine Chinese nationals of laundering 50 million US dollars from the Sinaloa cartel in Mexico. For the law enforcement agencies grappling with the fentanyl crisis, the indictment represents anything but an isolated incident. They claim the alleged offences are part of a process where over the past decade Chinese organized crime groups have moved in to launder the earnings of the Mexican cartels. The underground banks operate largely by selling the cartel's dollars to wealthy Chinese who, alarmed at the political tightening under Chinese leader Xi Jinping, are looking to circumvent capital controls and transfer their money out of the country. In essence, the officials claim, a new global money laundering network has evolved that marries two powerful financial forces, the huge stockpiles of cash being accumulated by the Mexican drug cartels from selling drugs in the US and the rapidly growing volumes of capital seeking an escape route from China. Chinese organized crime groups in New York, Chicago and Los Angeles who communicate via encrypted Chinese apps such as WeChat have created an underground banking system that minimizes the movement of funds across borders. Brad Setzer, a former U.S. Treasury official and an expert on global capital flows at the Council on Foreign Relations, a U.S. think tank, estimates that as of the first quarter of this year, private capital flight from China was running at an annualized rate of about 516 billion U.S. dollars. It was even higher in the third quarter of 2022, when it hit nearly 738 billion U.S. dollars. These levels are well above outflows in the last quarter of 2019 before the pandemic struck early in 2020, which were taking place at an annualized rate of 94 billion US dollars. Such levels of capital outflow are huge. They mean that a chunk of money roughly equivalent in size to Norway's entire gross domestic product is set to depart for foreign shores this year. Here ends the direct quote of the article, the full version of which is well worth a read. Let's end with a recent comment from Setzer himself. Quote, A lot of Chinese residents no longer believe that China's economic trajectory is clearly positive and thus no longer necessarily want to hold a large share of their wealth in China. As a result, many are looking to find ways to move funds abroad, even though that is technically hard for many average Chinese residents." End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much everybody for watching. Have a great Friday, have a restful weekend, and I will see you all tomorrow.